you guys are doing well. So winter is upon us. <laughs> and I don't know, I don't know if this affects you, Ryan, but this really affects me because I have to never mind. I'm not gonna bring that up. But <laughs> what? Why? What? So I get um shocked all the time, like really bad. And like I don't shocked, know shocked like yes. No, not yeah, not like everything is surprising to me. I mean like like static electricity. Okay. So, <laughs> I was thinking about that this week. And I don't know if it's just me. Am I like um a conduit? Is it, you know, do I have a higher electrical something? I don't know. Force around you? Yeah. You could. I I, maybe. It's well, worse in the winter? It is worse in the winter. So I looked it up. And it's because there's less moisture in the air, which makes sense. Mm, okay. But yeah, I highly I doubt that affects anywhere on the East Coast. It's so humid here. <laughs> I was about to say, I was like, do, does that even know? Where do you get shocked? Like on doors and stuff? Yeah, on my computer, on doors. Oh. Um, sometimes when I go to wash my hands, the water. What the fuck? I know. <laughs> it's pretty wild. Yeah, what? Are you in like Area 51 or something? I... <laughs> like, what? <laughs> what is what that... I'm saying? <laughs> yeah, I don't know if that's normal. That's interesting, but I have no idea. I didn't know that that was like more common in certain areas. Well, like, it makes sense about the moisture in the air here in California. You know, it's just not as humid, but maybe I'll do more research and see if people are prone. Some people are more prone. <laughs> I feel like that could be a very quick rabbit hole of like conspiracy theories. <laughs> oh, 100%. That's true. That's true. I should be careful, but yeah. it's the government guys. <laughs> this, yeah. <laughs> it's in the drinking water. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but this would be, uh, this would be good for your show. I think that you write eventually trademark guys. Um, person, your personal hell. Mm-hmm. That right? If you went everything you touched <laughs> would just shock you. God, that's awful. That right, exactly. Mm. Like a personal hell, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. I'll uh file it in the old noggin. There you go. Yeah. I'll workshop it. We'll see. Okay. Yeah. She's not <laughs> totally convinced. I haven't she's like, you sound crazier than last week, Morgan. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh anyway, so that's me right now. How are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> I know better than you no I'm just kidding um I'm doing pretty good I would say I had an interesting thought last night that I feel like kind of gave me a little bit of understanding as to like why sometimes my anxiety is pretty high and mm -hmm. as some of you may know if you don't know I'm planning a wedding right now and so you know there's a lot of moving parts it is pretty far away so that's good but I realized that as I start checking things off my list I almost feel like I have another heightened sense of anxiety, like after being done with a certain thing that, you know, I plan to do and now it's done um, or something blocked in, right? With a vendor, whatever. And I had this really interesting thought that like, it was like around the, the idea that like, just because something uh, is continually stressful that I'm working at, like just because it is continually stressful doesn't mean that I'm doing bad at it. It just means that the thing I'm doing is a big, you know, deal or, you know, yeah. it's important to me. And so I think that really kind of helped me understand that like, yeah, I was not really understanding why I wasn't getting like a sense of relief after being finished mm. with like a task. Yeah. And it's because like the work that I'm doing is just a lot, right? Like there's reasons why people have like full wedding planners and, you know, I mean, obviously there's other reasons because they have money to do it. But it's also just because it's like a big ask, right? It's a lot to incorporate into your everyday life. But this just doesn't apply to that. It's just kind of in general that if you're not, you know, immediately seeing the results that you want or you're not feeling like what you're working at is like actually improving in the day to day, it doesn't mean that, you know, you're doing a bad job at it or that you're wrong for doing it. It just means that the, that, that the thing that you're doing is a tough thing to do. And as you go through the steps to do it, it might not feel like it's getting easier. It just might be that you just need to keep doing it. You know what I mean? 
Yeah. Um, so I don't know. That was kind of a revelation. I worded it better in my head yesterday, but I can't remember <laughs> how I worded it, but it's okay. That, that was big for me. And I'm trying to remember that because yeah, I am not a planner by nature. And so really trying to stay on top of these things is tough for me, but it applies to like my life in general. Um, same thing when like I finish, you know, work in my, you know, professional life. It doesn't always feel like, oh, I did that. Yay. Like I'm done because I'm not done. Right. It's like a continual upward hill, you know, thing to do for me. And so I'm just trying to remind myself that, yeah, just because it's not easier doesn't mean that I'm doing it wrong. It just means that like, it's a tough thing to do, but to like keep right. going. So, yeah. Yeah. So did that bring you some relief? Uh, having that revelation? Yes, mm -hmm. it did. Oh, good. Um did not lessen my anxiety per se, but it did give me a better mindset on how to think of and like frame that anxiety. Right. Not as always bad, just as like something that I live with, you know? So. Right. Yeah. Hmm. yeah. Okay. Well, I have tried this. I'm not super good at it. As we know, consistency is not my strong suit, but um, just taking things as like smaller pieces. Mm-hmm right like we've kind of talked about this before but okay you're thinking about the wedding as a whole you're stressed out all this stuff but you have done a lot so far yeah you know and you yeah. can only do so much in one day right or one and week there, right right and there are many factors that go into some of the plans before they're finalized yes so I know you love a list and you're probably already doing this but having that list and checking those things off you know, that is your accomplishment for the day. I don't right. know if you're already thinking of it like that and it's not really bringing you much relief, but I do try to look at things like that sometimes when I'm feeling that way. Yeah, definitely. I mean, yes, in general, I'm not good at taking things <laughs> like in smaller bits. I'm more of yeah. just like take the whole bite and like figure it out later. But yeah. I also am moving into more of like a freelance schedule and that has its own set of anxieties because I'm not always working at the typical like nine to five hours. Right. And, you know, as much as that's something I've worked for, it, it takes a bit, a lot, a huge mind adjustment or hold on. it takes a huge mind adjustment to realize that like, Hey, it's okay that you're not working right now. Like that was the point, right. Mm -hmm. To have this time to figure out those things. So I feel like it's kind of just happening at the same time. And it doesn't yeah. mean again, that it's like bad or wrong. It's just that like, it's a lot of things to adjust to, um, and to adjust to a new lifestyle so that, you know, it, it does benefit me in the end. Um, yeah. but yeah, it just kind of felt a little bit insurmountable over this past week, but I feel like I am trying to, yeah, get back to my lists, get back to using the wedding book that Morgan got me, you know, and like trying to think of it as, yeah, more in terms of like, okay, what is, what am I looking at just for this month? Not what am I looking at for the entirety of the whole situation? That is correct. Right. So, yeah. yeah. So All I'll, right. I'll uh, keep you guys updated. <laughs> yeah. And we have some topics now for our next few episodes. So yeah. there you go. <laughs> yeah. Some deep dives into mental health. Love that. Mm -hmm. And speaking of this week's episode, kind of did that, which I thought was interesting. I mean, hmm. um, not so deep. We'll probably have to revisit this in the future. Okay. But definitely took me to a lot of psychology today pages in the research. So <laughs> love some good psychology. Let's go. We love it. Yes. <laughs> so let's get into it. Uh, today we are talking about intimacy. Yes. Love it. Yes. All yes. about it. <laughs> <laughs> so first question, what do we think intimacy is? Ooh, isn't that so interesting? There's so many words that you know in day-to-day -day conversation, but like if somebody actually asked you like what it means, you're kind of just like, well, for me at least, I'm like, okay, it's a, it's like a feeling of closeness. Actually, I don't even know if it's a feeling, but for me, I think it's like a feeling of closeness and vulnerability um, and being like the ability to be close and vulnerable, I think. Hmm. Don't know. Right. No, it's what do you <laughs> you're I'm on the same page as you. Okay. I mean, 
Yeah, that's what I, I thought. Like, I, I I feel like I know what it means and I can use it in a sentence. Yeah. But you're right. If someone were to just ask me, what is intimacy? I'd be like, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, please hold. Let me get Google. Like, right, right. <laughs> so let's get into it. Right. All right. So for many, the concept of intimacy conflates with the act of being intimate. So having sex. Um, and that's not quite right. In reality, sex is just one of the many acts of intimacy. Uh, what's more, physical intimacy is only one form of the word's many meanings, which according to Miriam, Miriam Webster is, quote, something of a personal or private nature, end quote. Oh, okay. Okay. So maybe we're not totally off base because that's a really vague definition. Yes. <laughs> but it does make sense because you can use intimate outside of um, relationship wise, right? Like that can be used. An intimate setting just means that, right? It's like a closed private occasion or matter, right? Um, right. So, okay. All right. Yeah. Yeah. So in fact, there are at least five types of intimacy all of which provide a means for being close to another person in any number of ways. And truly connecting with someone calls upon a combination of the five types of intimacy. Hmm. Now, so here are the five types. The first one is emotional intimacy. So this is cultivating a sense of closeness relating to how you and your partner feel via empathy, respect, and communication. Ooh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. More so, so think, where my mind was going. Right. Exactly. I think yeah. you encompass that one for sure. And what you said, mm -hmm. um, as far as being vulnerable and like connecting, I feel like those are definitely on the emotional intimacy uh, one. Yes. So, um, and this one, uh, when I, when I'm quoting here, I'm talking about um, a therapist and clinical content manager at real. So um, she says, it speaks to this feeling of closeness through the expression of personal, of personal internal feelings or thoughts or beliefs. And again, seeing those feelings received, accepted, understood, and heard by the other party. Emotional intimacy gives us the opportunity to notice the importance of truly actively listening to the other person and letting them know they are heard. Hmm. Okay. And that was the second type? No, that's emotional intimacy. Oh, that's okay. just her, she was just elaborating on that, gotcha. explaining okay. a little bit more what that means, uh, specifically in a partnership. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So the next one is mental intimacy. So this is, or it go. It says consider mental uh, intimacy as a meeting of the minds. Mm -hmm. It's satisfying, challenging, and stimulating. Ooh, I feel like okay. I like this one. Yeah. Yeah. Like one. <laughs> yeah. Right up your alley. I get yeah. that. Okay. My cup of tea. So she says, for some people, this is great wit and repartee. Uh, they love bouncing off each other, challenging each other. Mental intimacy can also be great talks about movies or a play you saw or a career you're both in or the causes that matter to you. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I can see this. Like, that's why it's like with mental and emotional, not just for intimacy, but like just those two concepts, like you always have to like, kind of take a step back and recognize like where you're coming from, right? Because if you're a much more logical thinker, right, you might be coming from the mental aspect. But for some people that are ruled more by their emotions, you kind of have to recognize where that person is coming from. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I feel like a lot of times in conversations, like this can get muddy because obviously mm -hmm. like, you know, your mental could be affected by your emotional and vice versa, but sometimes taking like that emotional portion out to just talk about things from mental, you know, perspective is good, but it's, it's just good to know and like distinguish the two. You know what I mean? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. That's a really good point. Yeah. Um, so a subcategory of mental intimacy is intellectual intimacy. So it says, quote, it involves creating a deeper understanding of someone's mind, including how it works and how they think. Hmm. Um, 
there also uh, she also notes that mental intimacy examples can involve having conversations that spark curiosity and intellectual uh, intellectually stimulate you, whether it's about new topics, common interests, or meaningful conversations about life. Okay. And she says, for some folks, this type of intimacy in a relationship is critical and keeps things alive. Mm, yeah. So, yeah, I would say this is a big one for me. Oh, for sure. Yeah. 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 You as I know you, but also me as well. Yeah, definitely. I think it would be really hard to have, you know, any type of relationship, honestly, without having this, because I do recognize, and I'm sure you've been in this situation as well, where like, you know, you might be digging deeper into something and you kind of just see people's eyes glaze over and you're like, oh, no, you don't want to talk about the ins and outs. All right. Got it. One thousand <laughs> like, percent. Yeah. Yeah. You know, have you ever been in a conversation and somebody's just like, you're so crazy. Like, you know, or like, you're so. Yes. I didn't mean that. If as you're a not name, watching. You know... <laughs> no, that wasn't directed at you. I'm just like, I. I can read that so quickly. I'm like, you are not here to hear. You're not here to hear. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Or somebody's just like, wow. Like, I don't know. You know, those different like words that have been used to describe people that just like are much more. Yeah. Intellectual. And it doesn't just mean smart. It just means like you like thinking about things and, you know, talking about the why behind it or the how or, you know, what led to those situations or whatever you know, and I've been in conversations where people are like, oh, that's like, that's too out there for me. Or like, that's too wild. And I'm like, I don't know. It's just kind of like talking, but okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like real yeah. conversation. You know what I mean? Right. Yeah. And this isn't to like rag on anyone. I just no. think like I'm, I'm my personality. And I think you're like this too. We're just both very curious. Like right. we we just had a conversation about static electricity and you entertained that for me because this was really something I was curious about. Yeah. So there's that's our good. example, right? Like, right. You know, most that's people a very be like, good point. Oh, yeah, that's wild. So anyway, yeah, <laughs> I would get so anyway, so hard by someone else. So thank you. <laughs> that's a really good way of putting it. Yes, I agree. And why not entertain conversation? I get if that's just not like you, if that's just not like your forte. Um, but sometimes being dismissive of others when they are being like that curious person can be tough to take because you just have to recognize like your, your tribe and like who you can go to for those ki types of conversations. You know what I mean? Yes. Um, because it's not every day that you find somebody that wants to entertain those kinds of conversations. Static electricity aside. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. But. And if you guys are feeling that way, uh, slide into our DMs because clearly yeah. we want to talk about it. <laughs> yes. There you go. <laughs> All right. So our next one is spiritual intimacy. Mm. So this one can skew tricky because it's rare for two people in a couple or friendship to be similarly in touch with their spirituality. Mm. But spirituality can take different forms or expressions. Maybe it's a code of values or ethics, for example. Hmm. Okay. Okay. I like this. This is super interesting. Okay. Is this okay? Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> no, I'm just curious what you're going to say. Yeah. Like, ah. <laughs> yeah. This is interesting <laughs> because, okay, one of my cousins who shall not be named, not for any particular reason, I just don't want to put people's information out there. But one of my cousins was talking about this concept because she does consider herself pretty spiritual, in touch, um, uh, she just likes to talk about things like spiritual, um, okay. which is separate from religious. Okay. Just like to put that out there. So she's really into like to, uh, talking about being in tune with like nature and oneness and like a higher power, mm -hmm. but it's net, but it's always just kind of vague, right. In these terms. Yeah. But one time we were talking and she was saying that she had like watched, um, some like sci-fi something, but I think it was like, I don't think it was like a developed movie. I think it might've been like a video online or something, but okay. it was basically about this idea that every time that you close your eyes, that like, you are like resetting your reality. And so they were like toying with the idea that every time your eyes opened again, that like you would be in a different reality. And that like, that's like the resetting, which obviously physically we know that that's not true, you know, but she was right. just saying coming from like a spiritual standpoint that like every time you open your eyes, like it's a renewed sense of like reality. And so I remember we were sitting and we were talking about this and there are like four other people there besides us two. Mm -hmm. And I was like, 
that's really interesting. I was like, because if you close your eyes long enough, like, and you, you know, you open them up, like, you know, your eyes kind of like have to take a second to like uh, adjust to the light. Right. You know, adjust to your surroundings. Um, if you keep your eyes closed, but then like go into a dark area, like it won't be as like, um, like polarizing to your eyes because right. like, you've you adjust already adjusted, right. right. You adjust quicker. And so we were just kind of talking about it. And I remember distinctly like two other people in the room being like, this is correct. Like, I don't know what you're talking about. Like, ha ha ha. And I was like, I don't know what I'm talking about either. We're literally just entertaining an idea. That's it. I'm not saying that I believe that we're in alternate universes and realities every time we open our eyes, but like, there's a conversation to be had there because this person feels passionate about it enough to bring it up and just like present it. It doesn't mean that I'm going to take this on as my own value and like never close my eyes again to stay in this reality. (laughs) You know what I mean? It just means that like, this is a conversation I've never been presented before. Let's like dive in kind of thing. So I don't know. I think about that a lot because I remember in that moment, like talking to another person that was in that group after they were kind of just like, yeah, what was all that about? And I was like, I don't think it was about anything. It was just like bringing up a new point of conversation that who knows if that would have ever came up again. I don't know. I'm not like everything doesn't have to like hold some deep value to me for us to talk about it. I think that's kind of the problem, right? Like people are so scared sometimes to entertain new things because it's like, that's not what I believe. And it's like, I'm not, no one's saying you need to, but it's also just important to like, think about it and get your ideas out there and like sift through what you believe to be bullshit and not to be bullshit instead of just accepting everything, you know, like. Right. I kind of feel like there's some, maybe like self-care method in there like that's kind of what I was getting out of it like Mm. if you you know people have different practices for things if they are frustrated or upset like some people count to 10 like Mm -hmm. some people like walk away for a minute or whatever Mm -hmm. that is but like meditate right right Right. that's what I was thinking when you were saying that like meditation like sitting closing your eyes and you know symbolically changing your reality Yes. By, you know, working on whatever internal like issue you're having. Right. Exactly. Yeah. And I do understand that like there are words that for lack of a better term are polarizing. I think sometimes when you say like alternate reality, people immediately go to like sci-fi fantasy and it's like, again, right. Like it's being able to be intimate about these types of concepts without like totally just like disconnecting from reality unless you want to like whatever I don't care where you live like what reality you live in but you know what I mean like I think it's important sometimes to like recognize that just for the curiosity's sake it doesn't mean that conversations have to have like this bigger impact and implication on your life we're literally just chatting and I also like we were smoking a lot of weed so it wasn't like this was like crazy out there you know what I mean but it was just kind of like this is interesting why not I don't know why not yeah yeah I'm a yeah I'm a little bit more like sus of the people who are like why are we talking about that (laughs) what are you in on it am I not supposed to know is there really something going on why are you upset no exactly but it's because it's like challenging (laughs) that like norm of conversation right like there's topics that you talk about there's concrete things that we know in this world and stepping outside of that for a lot of people is very scary because it gives way to like well where does it end and it's like I don't know what to tell you, but like, we don't really actually know much about this existence. Like, I'm sorry, I'm not trying to get too existential, but like the reality is we really don't. So right. like the fact that human brains, I mean, that's what separate separates us from different animals, right? Like the fact that the human brain is able to like talk about these abstract notions for no other reason than just curiosity, like we're talking about, who the hell cares? Let's talk about alternate realities. You know what I mean? Like, right. Cares? No, that's no. true. Maybe they were just, were they smoking too? Maybe they were just too high and they were like, you are freaking me out, man. <laughs> they were and they both were like, I get paranoid. And I was like, oh, okay, that's okay. fair. Yeah. yeah. So they're like, okay. no, I don't want to close my eyes because I'm scared I'll like wake up on Mars. And I was like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, there we go. Full circle now. Bit of now I get it. All right. Okay. okay. Yes. But no, but you made a very good point. That's very true. Have the conversation. Yeah. It's interesting. Right. I I don't only want to talk about like the the latest like trending video on TikTok. Yes. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. Well, there you go. Spiritual intimacy. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) All right. Next one is physical intimacy. So it says, to be clear, physical intimacy is not 
not important <laughs> just because it's a form most popularly associated with the term. So she says physical intimacy is essentially about relaxing into it, joining in the flow of it, getting into the moment and sharing, giving, getting, and expressing what feels good. Mm, Ran has no comment because we all know she's totally fine with her physical intimacy. Yeah. (laughs) So she says it's all about connection, excitement, the giving and getting of pleasure and closeness. Ask for what feels good. Go for what feels good. Mm, Okay. I like it. Yeah. Simple concept, but complicated path to get there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, it does go on to say physical intimacy doesn't solely pertain to sex, as most friendships don't revolve around or even include sex. If we forget that, she says that we miss out on opportunities um, with other forms of physical intimacy. Mm. So physical intimacy can entail things like handholding, cuddling, sitting close, uh, sitting closely next to each other or any other skin-to-skin contact that feels good to you. The goal of physical intimacy is, again, to create a feeling of closeness that feels beneficial to both parties. Mm, nice. Yeah. So, so it's Jose, it's like a boob grab. Don't put him out there <laughs> like that. It sounds like he's assaulting me. <laughs> he does it to me, too. <laughs> a consensual boob grab. Consensual. Okay. Well, we'll yes, we'll go with that. Yeah. So do hugs not feel beneficial to you, Morgan? Mm. <laughs> we have our answer. <laughs> sure, hugs are fine. Are they? Are they fine? We talked about this. I don't want a hug from a stranger who's like, I'm a hugger. Yeah. <laughs> you are That's not true. someone I'm trying to build physical intimacy with. Why? It just said friendships, physical intimacy. It's important. I don't want any other friends. But your friends that you have (laughs) want the physical intimacy. You know what I'm getting at. Hugging is not something that you are always the most giving with. Oh, you want hugs from me? Yeah. Oh. Dude, look at the way you said that. Look at the way that you (laughs) said that. As the most outlandish, like, closing your eyes in a different reality. (laughs) Yeah, I'm like, this well, why don't Morgan you close song. your eyes and in a, another reality, there's a Morgan that gives hugs. No, no. Fine, we'll, I'll give more hugs. I'll try. All right. I'll try. You heard it here first, folks. <laughs> this is for Ryan only, Jose. Don't you come I was me. Just- <laughs> <laughs> I was just going to say, Jose is going to be the number one listener. Like, excuse me, I heard on this date that you said I get I know. Yeah. He's going to send a text when he's listening to this on his way home from work. Yeah. Yes, give me more. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> more, yeah. <laughs> oh, my God. Fine. More hugs. Um. <laughs> okay. Last one is experiential intimacy. So this is. Um, or it says each of the four main types of intimacy include experiential intimacy. Mm. Experiential intimacy is all about shared experiences. So whether it's trying something new together or creating a routine, experiencing life together can spark intimacy at all stages of your relationship. Mm. This is where FOMO stems from. Mm. Yeah. Makes sense. You know, the you had to be there moments, the inside jokes, right? Like, this is all of those things kind of combined. It's like we all have that shared experience. And so now we can kind of move on from that, which is not only like shared trauma, but that is also right. Experiential intimacy as well. Right. Um, but yeah, yeah, I think that's, that's super interesting because you do have to like, you know, kind of analyze that and recognize like, was that shared experience actually beneficial? Right. Like, or is it just because we shared it? And so we feel like we should be like closer than we are or we should be uh, you know more on the same page than we are and that's not always necessarily true yeah you know what I mean mm-hmm. like no, it's true but I don't yeah. think it's necessarily one or the like I don't think if it was a bad experience it necessarily means it's like a not a real connection no no no, no. I'm yeah that that's definitely true but I'm just saying like a lot of times with shared experiences because you have that experience you feel as though 
like your perspective on it might fall more in line with each other, meaning that like you feel more mm. comfortable. But again, everyone has their own perspective. And so a lot of times when you recount situations, right, and everyone has their own version of what happened, mm. it's because you all actually experienced it differently, even though you experienced the same thing, right? Ooh. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good point. So. See, I told you, this one's a thinker. <laughs> I know, guys. Yeah. If you were looking for like some stats on, you know, <laughs> the right, breakups yeah. and all that stuff. Like, yeah. Like, How many people are intimate? That's not their, what type? You know yeah, what I mean? Like there's. Right. <laughs> all right. So let's talk a little bit of psychology. So, okay. Preface, this article is called Intimacy, the Art of Relationships, How Relationships Are Sabotaged by Hidden Expectations. And then it says it's by Lori Gordon, published December 31st, 1969, but then last reviewed June 9th, 2016. Oh, interesting. Okay. So they've updated it. Right, exactly. It's been updated, but I don't know which parts. Okay. (laughs) <laughs> I bet we but can I, decipher. We'll see. Right. Yes, exactly. <laughs> so I was going to say, kind of take this with a grain of salt or, you know, like put your thinking cap on because, um, well, let's just get into it. So, okay. all right. So it starts out confusion, hurt, silence, missed opportunity. It is one of the ironies of modern life that many couples today are living together as complete strangers or worse in great unhappiness. The data on divorce leads us to conclude that intimate relationships have been falling apart for the last 20 years or so. Which 20 years? I'm not sure. Ooh. Ooh. I feel like this might have been in the 60s, though, or like almost 70s, because that was Ooh, like true. people were that coming was back like... from war, Great Depression, you know, like a lot more like single households. Right. Yeah. Idea. Well, the sixties, like, you know, free love, all that movement was happening. Like, yeah. And also just like the, like the tearing down of the idea that like the nuclear family was necessary. Right. Right. Um, For better or worse, honestly, but okay. All right. Right. But also it could be side, from 2016. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So I don't know. I mean, oh. when they reviewed this in 2016, they were probably like, Probably like that still fits. We can keep that. <laughs> they kept that in. That's true. Right. Right. Good point. <laughs> so the truth is that couples have never learned reliably how to sustain pleasure in intimate relationships. Hmm. The difference is that, uh, or no, the difference is that it never ma- mattered so much before. Hmm. Okay. Okay. Interesting. Which if we are looking, if this, if we're looking at the 1969 context and how you brought up the nuclear, nuclear family, now I can't say anything, how you brought up the nuclear family, Mm -hmm. maybe that's true, right? Like, oh yeah, definitely. Because a lot of what we knew or a lot of what we accepted about being intimate was solely based on the goal of having a family and procreating, right? Like, yeah, there wasn't a lot of pleasure given to that until you kind of came to like the sexual revolution of the 60s, right? Where a lot of that, those ideals came out. But even still, when people talk about the 60s, it's still usually talked about the tropes of like, oh yeah, everybody was like wild back then. And it's like, or that was just like always going on and now it's still going on and it's just more normalized. You know what I mean? Like, right. Right. And I think there's like a mental health factor too that people just weren't considering. Like For mental sure. health is still sig- stigmatized today. Yes. Right. So if we're talking in 1960s context, like, oh boy. Yeah. Oh yeah. She's a nut thrower in the bin. You know what I mean? Like that was, yeah. there was not the conversations that we're having today, unfortunately. Right. Yeah, exactly. Unless you're talking about psychologists, right? That like, this is their work. So, of course, right. they're going to be privy to, like, what's going on. So, that makes right. sense. Right. Yeah. yeah. No, that's true. That's true. Okay. So, this next section, it says, here at the close of the 20th century. So, that would be the end of the 90s, right? That was because yeah. we're in the 21st century, right? Okay. <laughs> yeah. 
So it has clearly been reviewed multiple times. Right. So it says here at the close of the 20th century, we have the luxury of living in splendid isolation. Unlike in more primitive cultures, it says, quote, quote, primitive. Um, most Americans no longer live as part of a large family or community where we develop a sense of comfort and safety, a network of people to confide in, um, to feel at home with. And then she says, the author says, this I have come to believe is what has drawn many people into cults, which it's not wrong. Yeah. I mean, didn't like the Jim Jones thing happen in the nineties. Oh, I don't know. I think so. I think it's like 94 or something like that. Let's look that up real quick. Yeah. I should know this. this. Jonestown. Oh, 78. Oh, really? Was it that long ago? Yeah. Oh, I don't think I realized that. So crazy about the Jonestown, because it was called the Jonestown Massacre, right? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, because like they ended up, it was wild. If you do not know about the Jonestown Massacre and you can handle it emotionally, look it up. It's very interesting, but very fucking sad. Yeah. Um, but yeah, if you don't know about it, like that's where like the trope comes from. Like don't drink the juice, right? Like because basically- Don't drink the Kool-Aid, yeah. Don't drink the Kool-Aid, right? Because it, it's wild. I don't even want to get into all that. However, my mom knew somebody who sent her son there and she was going to go herself, but didn't have the money for her plane ticket yet. And her son died there. Whoa. Yes. That's why I was surprised when you said it was 78. Cause I was like, oh shit. I, for some reason I thought it was a little bit more current than that, but that's wild though. Yeah. Cause they went to what, what country was it? Guyana or yeah. Yeah. Guyana. Yeah. So fucking sad. Okay, continue, though, because this is a good topic. Yeah. This, well, side topic, we should have your mom on to tell us about that. That's really interesting. I mean, mean, very sad, though. I mean, that's really terrible for her friend. It is really terrible, but I like that they put in air quotes, like, primitive cultures, because really just moving away from, like, collectivist societies is really more what, like, they're touching upon. And it is sad. Like, people are craving for a sense of community, right? We've talked about that so many times um, on this podcast, but also off the podcast, like, People don't really thrive in individualistic societies. I mean, I think that's why COVID was so polarizing for most of, okay, talk about redundancy. I've used polarizing three times on this podcast. I (laughs) just, I I had the same thought, but it fits here and you're right. (laughs) Right. No, exactly. Because like individualistic societies, just as like a concept doesn't truly work that well because nobody can do everything alone right like I think we find that out all the time I'm literally talking about being overwhelmed about trying to plan an event by myself which no I'm not alone but when you start to feel alone is when you start to like look outside of you know your current circumstances so we've talked about how enticing cults can be so I'm just saying yeah there have been moments I mean Ryan wants to run one but I've had moments where I maybe would have picked up a pamphlet picked up a pamphlet yeah oh I totally could do it but see that's the thing like me and Morgan talked about this Morgan could totally be a part of my cult she would just have to be in on it you know she would just have to know I would be my goal was to be that thing (laughs) yes Ryan would be like the face yeah of the cult and I'd probably be behind the scenes like pulling all the strings (laughs) (laughs) that's fair yeah we would make a good team (laughs) Make a good <laughs> Back to cults. So the need to feel part of a bonded community. Um, there is a sense of being at home emotionally as well as physically. Hmm. Our culture provides for uh, for meeting all other needs, especially the need for autonomy, but not for intimacy. Hmm. Wait, so that was that separate, again? That was a separate sentence. So she's okay. saying... Our culture provides for meeting all other needs. So especially the need for autonomy. Okay. Being your own person. Sure. But not the need for intimacy. Yeah. 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 Exactly. Right. And I wouldn't even say provide. I think that's like a, I think that's being generous. I just think that that's like what's pushed at us, but true autonomy <laughs> oh yeah it's not like you know overloading people with debt when they're 20 years old that that's not 
helping the goal of true autonomy. Right. That's I'm a just... grown up now. Right. Yeah. Yeah. You're, you're right. Exactly. You're free to have whatever kind of healthcare you want, even if you can't afford any of it, but you're free right. to have it. You know what I mean? Like it's like, right. It, it, yeah. It's That's bullshit. true. That's true. <laughs> fair. Fair. <laughs> Uh, so within this framework, couples today must provide for each other more than the emotional needs that a larger community used to furnish. Mm. So yeah. that's an interesting thought. Mm-hmm. Right? Yeah. This is why you need friends. Socialism. This is why you need socialism. Oh, socialism. Okay. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> what were you going to say? To the bigger... <laughs> I said friends. <laughs> yeah. This is There's why you need. Yeah. Um, it's a start. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Friends aren't going to give you free healthcare though. So maybe we should take this to the, to the bigger platform. That's right. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah. But that's the whole concept around like mutual aid, right? It's like creating a community of people that can like provide for each other, you know, the bartering system, right? Like if you have this particular skill, I can help you with my particular skill. Right. Yeah. And it's much more effective because one, you're able to like employ someone and you know you you yourself are employed as well but also too you're able to build like a tr- a relationship of trust and communication there because now you understand like your areas of um you know success and somebody else's and so you're able to build off of that so it is true i mean it is like building relationships as far as like friendships as well but also just like giving back to like the community in which you're a part of so i um yeah, I have some strong thoughts on that, but we'll keep it on the topic of intimacy for now. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was very uh, mentally intimate of you to share. So oh, thank you. Intellectually intimate. Oh, I, I kind of said that kind of sensual. I didn't yeah. mean that. I was just trying to remember the phrase. <laughs> oh, but maybe that is sexy. You know what? Good job. Hey, intellect is sexy. Intellect is sexy. That's true. Yeah. That go read true. a fucking book, folks. Go on. <laughs> <laughs> okay so um so she goes on to say compounding the wide scale compounding the wide scale deprivation of intimacy we actually experience our cultural talent for commercial for commercialization has separated out sex from intimacy. In fact, intimacy involves both emotional and physical closeness and openness, but we wind up confusing the two and end up feeling betrayed or used when, as often happens, we fail to satisfy our need for closeness and sex. I'm really sorry, but that was a whole mouthful and I don't really (laughs) remember what you said. (laughs) If you could like run that back just one more time. Okay. So she goes on to say, the last part I pulled from this article, okay, compounding the wide scale deprivation of intimacy we actually experience. Our cultural talent for commercialization has separated out sex from intimacy. Mm. Okay. So then she says, in fact, intimacy involves both emotional and physical closeness and openness, but we wind up confusing the two and end up feeling betrayed or used. When, as often happens, we feel to satisfy, we fail to satisfy our need for closeness and sex. Yeah. I mean, this again, uh, I love when like people talk around concepts, like it's capitalism, like capitalism has, you know, like basically created like this very large divide between like sex cells and like what it takes to get sex, which is not just by buying it which you can right but like we've also shamed society for doing that so it's Mm. basically like yeah commercialization is an an effect of capitalism like we've decided that money is more important than people right profit over people so when Mm. we did that we decided that like we're going to push this in everything right make pepsi ads super fucking sexy and make you know everything uh, everything catered to like the over-sexualized version of what humanity is when in reality like being a sexy person or being you know in touch with your sexuality doesn't necessarily make you intimate right it just makes you a version of yourself which maybe you like maybe you want to be that right but with like our culture moving towards this like everything can be sexy It, it it makes it hard to like 
find like where you fit into that. Right. Because I think that's why, like for a long time, we didn't really talk about like sexual assault because that was pushed in every form. I mean, just watch anything before the year, like 2010, like it is so clear and apparent that like we have tried to be, or act as though we're okay with like, the over-sexualization of people, but then when those same people are hurt because people don't understand boundaries, because it's like, well, this is what everything is telling me to do, right? This is what everything is telling me around me that like a man should be, he should take charge, he should do all these things. When in reality, that's like highly problematic, (laughs) you know? And like, you know, not okay to do those things to people. So yeah, I totally agree with this. Uh, but it does leave people feeling very empty because they're just following what is pushed in our popular culture. It just isn't working out for them because they're not the ones on the big screens, right? Like, right. there's a reason Harvey Weinstein was able to do all the things that he yeah. was able to do for such a long time. I mean, but seriously, right? It's because yeah. he literally was <laughs> a creator of a lot of content that says you can be this way because this is what you can do when you're at this status. You know what I mean? Yeah. And that's not okay at any status, as we know, (laughs) you know what I mean? And so it's like coming into a different time now is good, but at the same time, it it forces us to reckon with the fact that we've created like a really ugly culture and can't be mad when people act on that culture. Like, you know what I mean? We can call it out, but we need to like also acknowledge that we've perpetuated this for a very long time. Like, Right. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's very true. So let's switch gears a little bit. So another Psychology Today article, this is called (laughs) Intimacy, A Path Towards Spirituality. Uh, The essential ingredient for true intimacy, how emotional safety frees our heart to love. Mm, Okay. Yeah. And this article is a little bit flowery for me. I I knew. From a psychologist. (laughs) You can see the way you you presented it. You're like, okay, this is this is a bit it, a bit much. It was just let's get into it. Okay, <laughs> so it says, and I just picked out some pieces. You know, I'm not going to just sit here and read whole articles to you guys. But um, he says uh, we're wired for long, or no, we're wired with a longing for safe, satisfying connection. But sadly, we may not be fully aware of how we disrupt the intimacy we want. If we can understand how intimacy gets derailed, we can become more mindful of what it takes to create emotionally safe connection. Okay. Okay. So feeling emotionally safe means feeling internally relaxed and open. When we're intimate, we feel connected. When we're not connected, we feel distant, protective, and overly cautious. Mm. A nourishing intimacy happens when barriers melt and hearts open. (laughs) <laughs> while mean, not yeah. neglecting the need for healthy boundaries oh that's so good how okay. that yes is how that ended sorry I had to pause in the middle to be you know critical to be a you know a cynic yeah to be nature. Morgan I know <laughs> <laughs> yeah no but I like you said that yeah that the barriers break down but that the boundaries can still be in place that's a very good point being guarded does not always mean that you have healthy boundaries. You know, it might be the opposite. You might be keeping p- people too far from you, but expecting them to like be more intimate with you. And it kind of doesn't work both ways. Like, you know what I mean? You have to be able to let people in while still, you know, yeah. Being respectful, being respectful of boundaries. Yes. Yeah. So, um, so in early romantic relationships, our emotional and sexual attract- attraction is often strong. We may be baffled that it fades over time, perhaps concluding that this isn't the right partner. Our dissatisfaction and confusion may prompt us to end the relationship or stray mindlessly into an affair. I don't know if it's mindlessly, but. (laughs) (laughs) So one reason that our attraction may diminish is the loss of emotional safety and connection. Trust is a fragile flower that takes time to build and is easily damaged. That's fair. It kind of sounds how like uh religious uh like like religious um articles talk about like virginity, you know? 
yeah precious flower right yeah. <laughs> once plucked it begins to die <laughs> right <laughs> yeah it wilts and falls off yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right yeah take that as literal or metaphorical as, as you need like... <laughs> oh, that's interesting okay. <laughs> so if we receive a steady dose of being blamed or shamed rather than respected and cherished our tender heart is likely to go into hiding to protect our vulnerable self yeah. 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 So we might think we should be stronger and just like let things roll off our backs. And in fact, it may help to explore whether we're taking things too personally, losing perspective, or feeling overly offended by lighthearted teasing. Mm. But hurtful teasing or shaming that poke our partner's tender spots are likely to push them away, therefore frustrating our desire to connect. Yeah. Interesting. I was thinking about when you kind of like touched on or when the article, I guess, touched on like the idea of cheating. I was just thinking about this. Dude, I tell you, I'm serious. Like when I say that like the intellectual intimacy is like one of the main things that like takes up time, you know, rip free in my brain. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> but I was thinking about like just like the psychology of like cheating, you know, because before I even had these, you know, terms to really talk about it, I was just kind of thinking about the fact that like, one, it has nothing to do with your current partner. It could, right? You could be doing it for revenge or whatever. But let's just talk about like a like a general, like, oh, this person cheated on the other, right? And also I was thinking like, why is it called cheated on? I don't get it. But anyways, we're not going to get into that. Mm. So okay. yeah, but I, what I was thinking about was that like, and it, again, it goes in line with this, is that like, again, if it has nothing to do with your partner, it has everything to do with you wanting to receive something that you feel like you're not receiving, right? Even if you are receiving it, but you're just not accepting it from the person who, you know, you feel like you're supposed to be accepting it from. When you seek someone else new out, there's more likely a chance that you actually don't have a real connection with this person. Maybe intellectually, you're not intimate with them or, you know, um, mentally you're not in intimate with them, but you're yeah. only focusing on the physical intimacy because that's the most like outward way of showing it, right? Like the actions yeah. behind it. And so I was just thinking about like, that's probably why like the love language, you know, figuring out like where, how you like to receive love is so important because you might just not be communicating with your current partner. Again, could be a myriad of other issues. I'm not saying that. But you might just not be communicating what you actually want to receive from your partner. And it's easier to not have physical or a mental and emotional intimacy with some new person, right? And not have yeah. to tell them all those things and just seek the intimacy that you feel like you're missing. You know what I mean? Or like right. you feel that you deserve or something or you're insecure about, right? Ah, like, yeah, I was just thinking, I was literally just thinking about that on my Metro ride. Uh, that <laughs> Deep thoughts on the Metro. I, but... <laughs> I am solo album coming out soon. Uh, <laughs> deep thoughts on the Metro. <laughs> deep thoughts on the Metro. Yeah. <laughs> but you get um, what I'm saying? Like, yes, that's true. And I mean, I think it was interesting. Like, that's why I was saying this episode's definitely more like psychology and mental more mm -hmm. than anything else because I didn't I mean like we said we couldn't define intimacy at the beginning and now we know there are five types mm -hmm. and so you know it's saying you need all five types to have like a fulfilling happy intimate relationship with someone mm -hmm. whether it's a partner or not and so but physical and I think that last article made that point like sex has been kind of what did it say like like it's yeah you can look it up but it's we been failed like brought to satisfy to our need for closeness and sex so we're looking for that connection but we're looking for it in all five different ways mm -hmm. but you're right like sex seems to be the most um the quickest way to get it right and this the second article is saying, you know, um, when you're first with a romantic partner, you do have like an emotional and sexual attraction. Like that's kind of where your intimacy starts. Right. So if you are, you know, stepping outside of that relationship, maybe cheating or whatever the situation is, then you are trying to get that. Yeah. Initial. Feel that 
right yeah fill that gap again. or whatever yeah. or even you know but there are also like a lot of sex workers that you know just have clients that they just talk to right because people feel that you know maybe they don't want to go to therapy or maybe that's just not what they're looking for right they're looking for like some of the sexual portions of being intimate intimate with someone else while also being able to just talk to someone else right while right. maybe feeling physically or attracted to that person helps their intimacy right. you know I don't know. That was just super interesting because I feel like that's really important. I don't know. A lot of times when I hear, you know, whether it's from somebody I, somebody I know or otherwise that like they got cheated on, it's always just like this ownership of something that I really don't think that you own, you know, like I got this thing, this thing happened to me and it's not to diminish anyone's feelings in those situations. It's just to like, maybe think about the fact that like other things are at play and I, I don't I don't know if that would actually even help in those situations. It's not going to console you to know that like, well, they were just looking for like physical intimacy, not intellectual or emotional that we have. Like, I'm not saying that. Right. But again, these are just conversations. <laughs> right. Yeah. In that moment, I don't know if I would be as no. high minded. Definitely not. <laughs> Probably no. be fucking pissed. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'm seeing red. So I don't care what's going on. <laughs> right. Yeah. I'm yeah. not thinking about the five levels of intimacy. <laughs> When I hear uh, you're banging some chick off Instagram, like, no. Yeah, that's a very specific situation. It's fine. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> oh, my happened. God. It's just my, the first example. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, so uh, to wrap this up, so an erosion of emotional, sexual, or spiritual intimacy can be caused by many factors. Um, a good starting point for unraveling this mystery may be to explore your possible contribution to the situation. So kind of basically what you were saying. Good job. Look at you. Psychology Today over here. <laughs> Special <laughs> guest on the pod today. <laughs> That's Brian the with solo album. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we love a callback. Okay. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> we both went to the same place. I love it. We have the intellectual intimacy for sure. Oh, we do. <laughs> oh, yeah. A little too much. Yeah. Seriously, we need to finish like, fucking is there, sentences. Is there one host on this or is there two? This is why we need to say our names at the beginning. <laughs> oh my gosh. Anyway, um, so are you experiencing unmet needs or vulnerable feelings such as hurt, fear, shame? that you were acting out indirectly or per or perhaps angrily rather than expressing in a non-blaming mature way i statements mm, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. all right so that wraps up our psychology so let's finish this out with how can we be or how can we have more intimacy hmm okay all right so 10 proven ways to increase intimacy. <laughs> Number one, <laughs> uh, disclose more to feel closer. So intimacy is the process of dis discovering with another. Um, over time, though, without continued attentiveness, it's easy to lose that urge to keep discovering all there is to know about one another. Mm. Stay curious. Yeah, yeah. Stay curious. <laughs> I like that. Is that a brand? Um, is that from something? Stay curious. I don't know. TMTM TM if it isn't. TMTM, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the first song on your album. Um, <laughs> okay. Uh, number two, make time for deeply emotional conversations. So these are among the times people feel closest when we share our thoughts at the end of the day, uh, when we're lucky, lucky enough to be able to do that, it feels very intimate. Mm -hmm. So that was one yeah. example, but maybe not all the time. Sometimes it's a lot. I want every conversation to be an emo a deeply emotional conversation. No, not every conversation, but I will say there's something for like the way they were wording it. I kind of got like schedule this a little bit more um, mm. because it's being proactive before it comes out in the heat of the moment and you're upset about Ooh. something else. Yeah. So I do definitely that's, agree yes. with this. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's true. Um, do something new or big together. 
Hmm. So uh, one example shared instances where uh, two partners felt closest um, when they have a productive talk about something upon which they disagree. But also she said uh, when they produce something together, having a productive talk, making something together, making plans together, going somewhere new, Mm -hmm. experiential intimacy. Yes. Racking up those experiential points. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) It's like Expedia, but experiential. That's That's what I thought of when you just said that. Um, all right. Number four, relish the routine. So when we're new to one another, whatever we learned is unexpected, resulting in intense emotion. Gradually over time, we would become more predictable to one another. So there's a positive side to this predictability. Um, it leads to intimacy where partners are so connected with each other that one, uh, that the one doesn't recognize the other is there. I don't know how that's the positive side. Uh, I get that because you don't feel like there's always this new element being added to everything that you want to do. Like this actually makes a lot of, a lot of sense when you think about it for routines, like in the morning, you know, let's say you're just starting to date someone, right. And you uh, maybe are spending a lot of nights together and then you, you know, end up spending the night and then, you know, waking up and your routine is your routine, right. You have Mm, this for breakfast, you do this thing, and then you go to work. But when you add a new element into that, you're like, oh, do I make double breakfast? Or are they going to make their own? Or like, oh, oh, they're in my way. The coffee maker's off still. You know, like there's a lot of things that go into those moving parts, especially if you are a very habitual person, right? Like if that's your groove. Um, And usually there's at least one partner that is more of the habitual, like routine heavy person. And so if you have somebody else kind of throwing a wrench into that, i.e. me, (laughs) you really have to like recognize like, okay, like what habits can I work into, you know, and like benefit Mm. them in. So maybe I'll turn the coffee maker on, right? Maybe I'll do the thing that, you know, will save them five minutes in the morning. And then it becomes like they're a part of the routine instead of, yeah, like this just being like a wrench in your plans every time. So that makes sense. I get that. Okay. Okay. You explained it way better than this article. (laughs) Um, (laughs) Well, number five is shake up the routine. So our interactions and close relationships tend to go along in well-worn grooves called scripts. Most emotion is the result of some interruption of the script. Mm. So keep, uh, keep doing the same old thing and you experience no emotion, but (laughs) no emotion. Sorry. I know. (laughs) (laughs) just become robots right yeah (laughs) but uh but stop what you've always done and suddenly uh someone feels something Hmm. so you can find out if a relationship is quote live by generating something unexpected just uh or such as one of you going away on your own uh going on a vacation to a new place together maybe It says, but sometimes it takes extreme action to realize how much intimacy there is or was. Why not plan for occasional minor interruptions so you don't need a major one to wake you up? Yeah, that's a really good point. Yeah, I I think that that's one of the biggest things. I mean, there's a lot of reasons why I don't want kids. But I think one of the biggest things is that like, Having like routines for kids is really important, you know, like I've seen it, you know, I I definitely think that that's super important because it gives them a sense of stability, trust, foundation, blah, 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 right? But like at the same time, like I do feel like the adults in the situation or whoever, guardians, whatever, do have to take that on and in turn, that kind of turns your life into a routine and so you tr- you can try, I mean, especially if you have the resources, right? You can add, you know, play dates and go to this place and go to an amusement park or whatever. But that th- those things are very expensive. And like, if you don't have the resources for those, I feel like it can just lead to like more of like a resentful relationship with the other yeah. person because you're just in this like habitual, like, this is what we do. And the kids have enough emotions because they're little people growing up that it's like, there's really no time for you to like tap into yours. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so maybe that's why okay so you know those people who'll take their kids to the movies at like 10 o'clock at night no <laughs> okay well I did not know that was a thing 
well, no, I don't think it's a thing, but I know oh. going to a 10 o'clock movie and then there's like kids there and I'm like, why are there kids here? They should be in bed. <laughs> okay, but fair, fair. Maybe these are the people who are still trying to shake up the routine. Oh, okay. Yeah. I mean, my dad took me to a few midnight showings of like Lord of the Rings and stuff. Oh, like young. midnight. Yes. So. I've been, that's true. But yeah. I don't know. I don't know what they were seeing. We were always seeing different things. I don't think there were kids in my movie theater. Well, once in a while. Yeah. Once in a while. I mean, over summer, usually I'll see like, I mean, yeah, they like that's raid true. the movie theaters in the malls. <laughs> so yeah. you'll see them. <laughs> right. Right. True. Yeah. But that is true because it adds like a sense of, excitement right to sure. their week um but I don't get excited about movies like that so I mean I like movies but if I had kids like I probably I just don't want kids I don't want to go down this road <laughs> we yeah we don't need all the reasons you do it's okay <laughs> I'm on the fence who knows I yeah. agree with most of what you're saying yeah yeah like yeah, but I could see you as a mom. Like you'll you'll do it. I know. I I would do it, but like <laughs> I have the choice of if I want to or not. Right. So. Hmm. Anyway, okay. <laughs> the next one is make it harder to walk away. So this example. So there was a married couple. They were stagnant. Um, they made a family project of a year-long sailing trip in the Caribbean, which like, like no. physically hard to walk away. <laughs> right. <laughs> you are literally trapped on the sailing boat. Yeah, it um, sounds like a nightmare. <laughs> so it says, as soon as they made the commitment and began planning the extensive journey, they felt quote pulled together. Their pattern um, of expressing no, what about this. I don't know. I mean, I told you about that co. I mean, I told you about that coworker that once her husband was retired, like her and her oh. two kids, which were still in school, like uh, like high school and middle school, I think, like decided to like you know move into like van life and like do that and stuff. And she was not excited about it. Guess what? Update. A few months later, they're not living in a van anymore. They moved back to a house because like that. I mean, that's like surprising only because I thought the update was about to be they're getting a divorce. <laughs> <laughs> Morgan the cynic strikes again no they're still together but I think it was just like this idea that yeah like this new thing that forces you to have more spend more time together like it really could end up being your prison you know what I mean yeah this is my nightmare <laughs> yeah <laughs> that's just so that's just too close of quarters. Yes. I mean, I just think it was also just a little bit impractical for their lifestyle at this point. I mean, point. yes. Yeah, if their no, kids that's were true. at least 16 and 17, maybe, because they're, one, probably going to be out of the van soon, and two, like, then you're, you know, you and your husband could travel. Or if they were, like, homeschooled, you know, maybe that would be a little bit more reasonable. They're not homeschooled? Being... I don't think so. I don't know. Let's oh like my God. That, You're but... like, dad, I have to go to school. And he's like, okay, I'll drive our whole home to the like drop off line. <laughs> so I think what it was is that they still had their house. I think they were just living. At... I don't know. I really don't know. I know he was military though. So I think that they did have a house on base. They mm -hmm. were just using this as a way to open up their, you know, uh, options to where to go because if you know anything about like living on base like it's pretty I mean again it's pretty like routine heavy right like right they have certain things at certain times you can get a lot of benefits from living there right cheaper gas cheaper groceries all those things right discounts on things but it is kind of a little bit confining I could totally see that being like a little bit confining so I think the right. idea was like on the weekends or like long extended trips using the van as like a way to get out and see more of just like you know the country kind of thing so in theory that does sound really cool but I do think that just in general like again this idea of like oh well we're making this commitment so like it'll bring us closer together kind of just again seems like your own personal prison so <laughs> <laughs> that's true and it doesn't bring up kids anywhere in the example so that would probably be a whole different story right right exactly. but this feels like um feels like it could be the beginning of one of my true crime podcasts 
like, oh, this couple was having a rocky, you know, they were going through a rocky patch. So they planned a year long sailing trip to the Caribbean, but only yeah. one of them came home. <laughs> yeah. So just saying. It could be. I mean, yeah, but all right. Uh, well, let's stop being so cynical. We'll just wrap up their example because it could work. It could help. So basically in the sailboat, neither of them could just walk away. So they learned to talk at a deeper and more honest level. Damn. They needed like the open seas all around them so that they couldn't like literally jump ship. <laughs> right. Yeah. It's, it's this or murder. <laughs> I would not go on a, like if we were at this point it, I don't know I don't know who my partner is but I'm like I'm I act- you sideways if you're trying to get me if we're in a rocky patch and you're Pardon, trying to get me on you, a year-long sailboat you need to take a break <laughs> off of the true crime okay you need to take a break uh because I can actually see a lot of validity to this like I'm not saying that I want to do it necessarily although Ben does like to sail so he might sail I don't know about a year long oh though. yeah mm-hmm. That's yeah really specific I didn't know mm-hmm. he was sailing Huh. Yeah, he is. Like, he really likes it. He's, I'll tell you later, whatever. Okay. Uh, <laughs> but the point is, um, I do see the validity in, like, the day-to-day uh, monotony getting in the way of, like, really being able to take time and, like, dig into issues. Like, there is a reason why vacations yeah. are important, right, for your mental. To break away from the everyday woes and, like, just settle in, read a book, like, think, right? Stare at a beach, like, whatever it takes, even people watch, right? Just to give you some perspective outside of your own. So I do actually see some validity and why this could be like a very good, like um, mental and, you know, emotional stamina builder. Like I could, I, I do actually get it because it's like, you you need that space away and some people live with their families you know some people Mm -hmm. live you know in really close quarters some people live you know very close just in general to a lot of things and so you just don't really have that time so I actually can see this as a positive I wouldn't say if you were just like totally rocky and you're like oh my god I like we hate each other but I could see this being more of just like a we are so busy and engulfed in our lives like maybe just taking a pause right yeah and also too they did probably have to stop at a few islands I'm, I, I don't think they were just like out on the open seas for like 364 days until they got to the Caribbean you know what I mean like right you have to take like pit stops so there's that as well that's true that's yeah. true that's true okay <laughs> fair enough I would do this just not on a sailboat that's all I'm oh, saying okay not going on the sailboat there's some nice sailboats but all right um, well that's for you and Ben that's for How your vacation. Are nice. They look huge. Yeah, I know. I just, I don't want to go on a year long sailboat. It doesn't have to be a year. <laughs> <laughs> oh, number seven. Okay. <laughs> so ensure that it's safe to be open. So what if you, you know, what if you are part of a mismatched couple where you crave a deeper level of con- uh, communicative openness that your partner never will Mm. so comfort levels with verbal sharing typically do increase with practice in an emotionally safe context so continue to work on becoming a non-judgmental listener yeah yeah i agree and get some friends that you can talk to (laughs) yeah (laughs) all right number eight so consider whether you're a better match than you think So people vary as to how much intimacy they require to avoid loneliness and how much they can tolerate before feeling saturated. Mm. Those with stronger needs will work harder to ensure intimate contact with their partner by listening more closely and encouraging their partners to be more expressive. Mm. If the need is weaker, then there will be a weaker correlation between intimacy and relationship satisfaction. In other words, if you don't crave the level of total closeness I'm talking about here, you probably won't mind if your partner isn't that keen on sharing his or her own inner life either. Mm, Okay. Yeah. That's interesting. I get that. Yeah. 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 Number nine. (laughs) Give credit where credit is due. So the free easy talker can learn to recognize and give credit to a partner's preferred modes of expression, which Mm -hmm. I think 
kind of how you were touching on like your love language and things like that. Right. Um, some individuals equate communication with intimacy. In one study, more than two thirds of divorced couples said they didn't have a great level of conversation that they'd expected in their marriages. Totally makes sense. So the women especially complained that they wanted to talk about negatives as well as positives. And they especially wanted to talk about work. But the give and take, the emotional exchange they sought was missing. Mm, yeah, I get that. It's it's like sad though, because it's it's so funny. Like as I get older and I see how like, you know, stereotypically men talk around their friends like they are not as closed off as like I think a lot of people believe them to be you know like oh men don't talk about things they just like like that's like not true like men are actually like really big gossips and it's real funny when you get around like groups of men because it's just like y'all gossip just as much it's just in a different way you know they might not dissect like the motives behind it but they definitely still gossip definitely still have those conversations as well you know um But again, I just think it goes back to like, I just liking your partner, like loving your partner and liking them are two different things. Mm, Yeah. Like completely different things. Like I have love for a lot of people, but do I like all of them? Do I want to spend time with all of them? No, like, of course not. And I just know so many people that I'm like, I just don't think you enjoy their company. And that's huge. Like, that's huge. Like being able to provide for a person, being able to yeah have those kids meet those life goals does not mean that you will enjoy those those people's company that's just like a coworker. i mean you know what i mean like yeah i don't know yeah that's getting the job done yeah exactly does not mean you need to like cohabitate (laughs) yeah oh true okay and number 10 intimacy is more than words or sex So only a third of the divorced men in the sample above said that they didn't find the emotional intimacy they wanted. What some of them missed, though, was their wives being there for them, quote, in much fuller ways. Mm -hmm. They wanted to or they wanted concrete demonstrations of intimacy, such as being kissed or asked how they are at the end of the day and being greeted with open arms at the door. As long as the less articulate, no, as long as the less articulate demonstrate their love in their own ways, they deserve credit for their thoughtful behavior, as well as extra patience and understanding on the part of the talk deprived. Mm, Interesting. Yeah. So I think, yeah, this kind of goes back to your point again, like understanding how people communicate their emotions or their feelings or I don't know like you know it's important yeah it really is like it really is like when someone comes home I mean just to the point of like yeah wanting to be greeted with open arms when you come home like that's a really big important way to know that your partner communicates because some people when they get home don't want to be bothered that's me like I want to go and like have my time and relax and like whatever I need to like think through in my own brain and then I will come around and we can like chat you know but like if that's not you right if that's not my partner I need to know that right like I need to know those things and so Yeah, it just comes back to the idea that like, I mean, this makes sense, though, because a lot of times like with intimate partners, you want the things that you think are going to bring you happiness. You might not think about the ways that like your actions are going to affect the way your partner shows up for you. You know what I mean? Right. It's not just about like your checklist of what you see for yourself. It's about how your actions as you, the whole other human being in this situation, is going to impact their ability to actually do that, you know? Like, I don't know, man. I just, I think about these things a lot and I think it's really important. (laughs) And like, I notice that people don't really dive into their relationships this way, which makes me really like second guess why, or, you know, or like, it makes me critical of why like divorce rates or why like friendship breakups are more common I don't always think that it's just this breakdown in like, we just went our separate ways. I just think a lot of times it is more of just like breakdown and understanding of like your actual nature, you know, like that self-awareness piece. Yeah. You know? Yeah, that's true. 
That's true. That's a good point. Yeah. Well, on that note, are we doing this wrong? Obviously, I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, I've definitely done it wrong. Uh, yeah, it's taken me a long time to get here. I mean, developing self-awareness like, and a serious sense of humility about yourself is one, important, but also two, not that common. So, you know, I don't know. Have you ever been in a conversation with someone and you're like, you have no self-awareness about yourself? Yes. Right? Right. Yeah. I met this girl that was like running so high on anxiety and was like, I mean, I'm chill. Like, I'm chill. I'm chill with whatever. (laughs) And I'm like, your shoulders are in your ears. Like, you are not chill with any, (laughs) like, what? Like, I mean, I'm easy going. Like, I'm going with the, like, you're not though you can't say that enough and convince yourself that you're you're that right it's okay to be the way you are but like you need to understand that you are not what is coming out of your mouth like I don't know it's it's very bizarre sometimes but so yeah I I I mean if if you're new she probably didn't want to be emotionally intimate with you and tell you oh yeah I'm a total wreck I have so much anxiety and I'm a mess like you know, people still want to put that mask on until yeah, they're ready to be intimate. But see, but I, but that's the thing though. I think you're like, I think when you say that, like intimacy does not mean vulnerability. It like the, like the, one of the cornerstones of it is just communication. Like you have, like, it takes honesty to be intimate. Like it's not about keeping on a mask is going to serve literally no one, especially you. <laughs> like her saying that in that moment only is going to compound the real, like the reality of what she's actually feeling. It's not going to help because then I'm going to take the lead and that's the opposite of what she wanted. She actually wanted to call the shots, which I let her and she called <laughs> down, but it was only because I was <laughs> reading her to be the person that she's actually showing me she is. But if it was actually, she was go with the flow then I would have been like, okay, cool. Let's just like keep it loosey goosey. And that would have literally <laughs> sent her into a spiral. Like, <laughs> it wasn't serving anything, but I right. hear you. I get what you're saying, but I'm just like, right. And maybe putting a mask up isn't the right thing, but like, I mean, I can't say this now we have a podcast where we literally put all our shit on blast, but like not everyone wants everyone to know their personal business. You know what I mean? And like, this was like a more specific example to like your work situation. So yeah, she's probably a little bit more like type a wants to be in charge and like you read that from her so that's you know you more comment on your skill being able to read people than her skills and being able to be open about how she's feeling like especially right. maybe if that was the case like nobody wants to be like yeah I'm super uptight and so I want to be in charge today is that okay who's gonna say that I <laughs> I well I think more people should say it and some people do say it and then I can like I can go with that because then I can like actually counter that with something that I feel like well let's talk about it or you know what I mean right but it's harder to get to that point when like what you're saying if I'm understanding this correctly is that not everyone wants to do that but like I am saying that that is a problem (laughs) Right. This no, is why we have saying, like an I... HR department to like <laughs> mediate conversations because people are like, I mean, I just want these things. And it's like, you never said that you never voiced that this is the way that you actually operate. You just right. tried to make it out that everything was okay. When like, it's not, you know, you've been in those meetings where they're like, so everything's great. You're great. We're great. We're all great. However, we have a list of things that are being done <laughs> wrong. And it's just like, Okay, the sandwich method is only like so successful. You know what I mean? It's only so effective. (laughs) Right. No, I get what you're saying totally. I'm just playing devil's advocate a little bit because I think people and maybe just from my perspective, because I know I can be a people pleaser. So like no, nobody's trying to like step out and ruffle feathers and just I'm going to be myself. Some people are and that's great. Go live your life and do you. But I'm just saying that's probably where they were, where she was coming from. Yeah. So. I mean, definitely. Right. Yeah. Like, right. but I mean, yeah. Okay. I mean, I, but to me, like, you know, this about me though, that right. Like, I think this is why it's doing it wrong. Core. Right. Because it's like, 
this is the point of the show. We think it's being done wrong. Like I know I do it wrong. I have probably serious intimacy in issues as yeah. we probably, as I have probably demonstrated in previous episodes. <laughs> yeah. Everyone at arm's length. <laughs> yeah. This is Look, why I can't Ryan, get a hug. Ryan knows me probably better than anyone. And she's over here like, you don't hug me enough. Like, obviously, clearly. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, we can finish each other's sentences, but God forbid I like, you know, greet her at the end of the day. I don't know. You know what I mean? No, that's fair. That's true. But like, but I, I guess one of the reasons why maybe our friendship has worked for as long as it has is because like, it's just the ability to be honest about it, right? Like it's yeah. not always, and again, and again, that is an intimate act. We've worked on that over the years, but I do think that there is something to be said about like coming a little bit more forthright with that, with like those things. And, and I know that that's hard because I do wear things on my sleeve, which is why I might feel a little deeper or I might get hurt easier but that to me is easier because at least I know instead of like this long lingering feeling of like, maybe something's happening. I don't know. And then, you know, later feeling resentful about it because I spent so much time doing this. So those are the things that I feel like I've done in the past where it's been like, definitely wrong. I didn't know how to go about intimacy. I didn't really know what it meant. Yeah. And I still obviously don't like, I'm like learning new definitions tonight. <laughs> right. This is like you know? a lot to digest. I yeah. think I mean even just knowing like the five different types right and like the difference between like we barely touched on like sexual intimacy right yeah we exactly could, you know we could do a whole nother episode which... oh that could totally be a subtopic I love it yeah <laughs> I know yeah so um yeah it's a big Ooh. one it's a okay. thinker like right. I said I'm still yeah the the gears are turning I'm still right I'm still in it I know <laughs> I don't want to blink because I might not be here <laughs> Oh. <laughs> oh we've come a long way <laughs> we have and this is gonna be a long episode so let's call it <laughs> i know I'm calling it <laughs> uh, all right guys well don't forget to pick up ryan's new album <laughs> that's, what on was it? that's on the metro yeah <laughs> it legitimately could it fits more in like 2002 but i i think i could still i can see the cover <laughs> i can yeah. like envision the cover already <laughs> i'm not, like looking out the window Yes. Yeah. There's like a couple of raindrops like streaming down. Oh, yeah. You know? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I feel that. So, we'll workshop. We'll let you guys know how <laughs> it's going. <laughs> All right, guys. Have a wonderful whatever you're doing, and we'll see you in the next episode. Bye -bye. Bye -bye.